So Harrison would win, and that whole thing where image became more important than anything else. Image. That became the key. And so it wasn't so much what he believed in, in what he said, it was the image he portrayed. And so, with that, he was elected, did we get to what happened to him? The bell rang right when he was elected, right? And he won a national victory. In fact, it'd be the, the South would win, it'd be a non-Democrat would win the majority of Southern electorates in 1840. That would not happen again outside of Reconstruction until 1964. When Harrison was out for media, the Democrats would win would win the South pretty much straight on through to 1964. It was called the Solid South. We'll get to that. The issue was civil rights. We'll come to that a little bit later. So yeah, let me tell you very quickly what happened to Andrew or what happened to Harrison. So Harrison, he was considered to be kind of a lightweight. He was the oldest man ever elected. In fact, he'd be the oldest man ever elected until 1980 when Ronald Reagan was elected. Now, Trump has been Trump is now the oldest man ever to be inaugurated. And Harrison had this reputation of being you know, old and kind of feeble, even though he wasn't necessarily that, but not very bright. He was a puppet of Henry Clay. So he is going to, so it's March 3rd, 1841, and he's going to give this really long speech. And he's going to prove to everybody that he is young, fit, vigorous, and in charge. So not only did he give the longest inaugural speech in history to this day, and it's shockingly boring. I've read it. Oh, that would be my punishment to you. You have to read that speech. Or no, better yet, listen to it. And I just read it, and... I couldn't make the inauguration. But it was really snowing, kind of sleeting, cold, wet March day. And he didn't wear his top coat or top hat because he wasn't fit. You know, so he could take it on fit. He got a cold, moved into his lungs, infected, pneumonia. And what did he do for pneumonia in 1841? Maybe not, but you hope for the best. He was already pretty old. And he died a month in office. He became the first president to die in office. William Henry Harris, just a month. And what's such a big deal about that is who became president? Who was his vice president, do you remember? Oh, and Tyler, the only reason he was a Whig is his hatred of democracy. He didn't want any of the Whig programs. It's going to be an issue. We're going to get the first president kicked out of his own party. And so, let's get to, while that's going on, there's also movement westward. Manifest destiny. I accidentally, I don't know how I put an E in there for destiny. Yeah. And so they were giving me a bad time for a period. So I said, okay, you want an E? I'm going to give you five E's. Five E's. Five more E's. I'll show you. Manifest destiny is becoming a continental nation. That means going from sea to sea. So the United States is going to spread across the nation. Remember after the Battle of Tippecanoe in the War of 1812, what did citizens of the United States start calling themselves? American. This is our continent. And so, sea to sea. And there's that desire to push westward. And this is a painting, Westward We Go. It's one of the more famous paintings of that kind of uh, Hudson School of art. And here's Lady Columbia, who was about 90 feet tall, and hard to find clothes for her. She's moving westward, and it's a great painting to show this American vision. In fact, before we get to that, let me get, I kind of jumped the gun here. There are, are three big reasons the U.S. want to become, or this idea of go west, and it was, first off, the idea of spreading American civilization, superior American civilization. Superior American civilization. And the idea that somehow, or that everybody wants to become American is our duty to spread our culture everywhere. It's very nationalistic. And wherever people go, so when they leave the borders of the United States, so in 1840, if someone's saving the Oregon Trail, they leave the United States when they cross the continental divide right here. And they're going into disputed territory. 
No, they're not asking the people who live here. Or if they go down to Tejas or California, they're going into a foreign country. But when people in the United States were moving westward, they didn't also become Mexicans. They brought America with them, or at least their vision of America. Wherever they went, to their, to their point of view, there are Americans. Now, let's be clear about it. Everyone can have a different definition of what that means, but they brought that with them. And it's an important part of this expansion westward. When the United States is going to conquer all this land, they conquer these parts as equals. And we said first, when the states came in, they came in just like what the Northwest Ordinance said, with the evil states. And so, American civilization, and this personifies it. Here is the advancement of America westward. So you'll notice, first wagon trains, prospectors and mountain men, a little more you know, organized stagecoach, Railroads, then look at the city and commerce. And what is she carrying with her? Hmm? That's Constitution. Or it's actually can be interpreted as Constitution or the Bible. It really depends on what you want it to be. You know what I mean? And it's not, it's not electricity yet. Telegraph. Telegraph wire. And who's running away? In the dark. You see it? Yes. Now, American Indians, the buffalo, all those uncivilized, savage ways are pushed forward by the advancement of civilization. And look at the way they shade the painting. Look at the uncivilized area. In the dark. Unknown. The light of civilization following Lady Columbia. And this color issue Light, dark are going to have serious racial undertones. Yes. Well, in special topics in American history, next semester we are going to do a unit on 1950s horror movies and culture. And there is a classic 1950s horror movie called The Attack of the 50 Foot Woman. So it's basically the story of the culture. It is it is one of those horrific B movies. Anyone ever see an ad for that? Yeah. I've actually watched part of it. It it makes bad movies. It, it does bad movies injustice. It's so bad. But number two, trade. They want to open up the lucrative trade with California. I mean, you know, with uh, China. The, all the new products from China were coming in. What were the big products from China, by the way? Silk. Tea. Tea. No, it came from India. That's how they got it. That's when they got the Chinese to open up the market. And the U.S. is very much about the Chinese ex, uh, trade just exploded in the 1830s. So we want those harbors there, but not just that. This area here, up until the 1860s, was uh, where all the U.S. whaling ships sailed from. And by the 1820s, they had killed most of the whales in the Atlantic. What did they use whales for? Uh, oil from rams. Yeah. I mean, for other things, for their bones, corsets, um, you could do some things, but the big thing was the oil. And and, 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 and they would, yeah, and it's kind of amazing, they would they would render it down and get something that smelled good. How much oil Oh, you know, I don't know the exact amount, but I know it was barrels. Yeah. And kind of this, it smelled bad, but it burned for a really long time. Well, they were already taking the fleets to the North Pacific, and they would be gone for five years. But they would leave Massachusetts and come back five years later. So they needed whaling stations. And it was big business until kerosene came and they find another reason to kill all the whales. Which we almost would do. But that's why the Sandwich Islands, as they called it then, would become so important. Yeah, that's why. And I like whales, so it makes me very sad. I didn't know any whales then, but next. Land. And the big thing about land was, remember that idea in the United States. That idea. That small farm, become a yeoman. And that was this American dream. And that's what people wanted. This American dream. They still had that idea. In fact, it's going to go on until anybody know when that kind of idea of the get your own small piece of land and become an independent farmer. When did that die? Even before that, even though the 70s would kill it off. Yeah, the, the farm depression actually began in the 20s, you're right. Blew it up, just destroyed it. But the other thing is diffusion. And that was your bonus question, wasn't it? Yes. 
So diffusion means spread out the number of slave states. And originally, Jefferson was thinking, spread it out so slavery can go away. But now, Southerners want to spread here and maybe down all the way there as more slave states to protect slavery. More slave holding congressmen and to avoid the problem of slavery. And so, Manifest Destiny, why I put it in the unit with the events leading up to the Civil War, is because this ties directly to it. In fact, you could argue this expansion westward will be the connection, or will be, I'm sorry, the trigger of Civil War. It's slavery in new territories. Has everyone got that? That is the most important issue that will lead to the horrific Civil War that was started in 1861. Everyone got that? Slavery in the territories. It's not just slavery. It's slavery in the territories. Now, the Southern point of view, they need slavery in the territories to protect slaves here. More and more Northerners, yeah, they, they didn't like the slavery here, but they didn't want it to spread to the territories. What do you call somebody who didn't want slavery in the territories? Free soilers. And that would be the trigger. Yes, it all comes back to slavery. I mean, there are always going to be differences, but slavery would be the one that it would apply. And it would tie in with her. So, the first citizens of the U.S. that would go to the West, and we're not going to go into great detail on any of this, were the mountain men. And that's why we do teach a, uh, this Pierce teaches an American West class. I believe it's only one semester. And she teaches it this year. We might have a shake-up because there might be some people going, unfortunately. But uh, that will go in more detail about this. But uh, the mountain men were the first, and they were trappers, or more importantly, they, they traded. They traded with various tribes for fur. And the big reason why they would come 1820s and then literally just ended in 1840. They came for, into this area, got across the plains as quick as possible. That's Joe Meek, one of the great mountain men. What are these? Beaver. Yeah, beaver pelts. And they traded for beaver because of the carriage trade. The carriage trade are what wealthy people in London and New York rode around in their fine horse car carriages in, what they wore. Now, beaver, they would make this kind of circular pelt, stretch, stretch it out and let it dry, and then they would scrape off the thick hair on top, and underneath would be a fine felt that's really warm, really soft, and that's what they would make hats and sometimes top coats on them. And it would take, I think, what, seven beaver pelts to make a top hat? It's something like that, seven or six. Yeah. So this is big money. And so they would come and they would trade for these, and they would slaughter beaver like you can't imagine, which is really, I like beaver too. And it would be a real problem because um, there'd be a lot of the health of the forest would be affected by the chef. Actually, you can your money back from the military too, too much to create water for the military. Um, just like in New York, there's a the cold war, they would buy beaver pelts and the tables also really Waterproof and warm, yeah. yeah. And then also the Civil War would be like a burst of, like little bits of burst. One of the most famous of the fur trading forts is in Montana, so I got to mention it. Made by the American Fur Company called Fort Union. And that's what it looks like today. They whitewashed it so everyone can see the fort. So it's this bright white fort. And it's exactly, as close as they get it to like 1830. And it's right on the border of, the, of Montana and North Dakota, just where the Missouri and the Yellowstone run together. And it's really cool. If you've ever been a check, you've never been there. It's really cool. I mean, wow, is it neat. They've done a great job. You go, you walk through the front gate, you go into like this different world. And they have people doing all the, you know, they're acting like they're back in 1835. And the board is set up like it was. And then I've burst a couple times, but for the most part, it went away in 1840. Because in 1840, the carriage trade just switched. Just boom, we don't, you know, beaver pelts are sold. We don't want that anymore. They wanted clothing and hats made from what product in China? The silk. Also, the silk trade exploded, and beaver probably saved beaver. They would have killed them all. I agree. Beaver are really cool and really important for the health of the whole forest. Don't pet one. Has anyone ever been close? I've had beaver once crawl right over my legs, or my feet. Wait, why? I'm not. I was sitting near Rock Creek. 
near Phillipsburg, Rock Creek. That's how you say it if you're in Phillipsburg. I'm not from Phillipsburg, but I'm standing next to it, and it's like this, and I'm like, oh, right over my foot. And I waddle off. Not what? <laughs> That's why we yeah, I mean, I just went, went right over one foot. No, they are scared of not one They had the big flat tail. It was really. I, and it, I wish I would have had a camera. Then I would have stopped every day. So, most of the mountain men became either, some just became farmers like Joe Meek in the Willamette Valley, one of the most famous Oregonians. And some became, you know, they, they would help wagon trains westward. They they scouted for the army or scouted for the government to make roads. Like Jedediah Smith, the great mountain men helped uh, make the Oregon Trail, for example. But pretty soon, though, we're now, after 1830, you're going to see more and more a desire to move westward. It coincides with the Industrial Revolution. Like, I don't want to be stuck in the factory. You know, I want to get, you know, now this new civilization is taking over. I'm going to go west. And the big thing about that is, first off, to get over the Great American Desert, that's what they called this. And not far from the truth. And and then get to either Oregon, California, or Texas. And the three of the most famous trails, Santa Fe Trail, you been to Santa Fe? Cool down. Cool, cool place. The Rio Grande is really neat there. And but the most famous trail, the trail we really do need to know is the Oregon Trail. And the Oregon Trail, a lot of people went west on it, or they took a California cutoff. But you think about it for a second. They're going, they cross the divide, and they're in a different country. And so they were incredibly daring, had to be brave. And if you've ever been in this area, what do you live on? Nothing. There's virtually no water. There's a couple of forts like uh, Fort Bridger and Fort Hall where you buy supplies, but the prices are outrageously high, you know, for us you go. And you can only bring so much on your wagon. Uh, this is a Conestoga wagon train. This is actually the 1850s, but you get an idea. And the other thing is, most people walk. There's not enough room on the wagon. So just contemplate, I'm going to go walk to Oregon. No, they were of a different breed back then. Tougher generation, right? You with me on that? The older generation? We were tougher. <laughs> well, the thing about riding is almost no room, and the thing about no shocks. You go on that bumpy road, people would get like virtually that seasick. Nauseous riding it. It was awful. You would huh, Well, no, I rode on top. I surfed. And but you know, I rode in a I rode not the older armored personnel carrier we used to have for the army. I rode one for a while and rode the country you know, just I was probably fifteen and I got seasick. You're in it, you can't see you're going up and down. So now I can understand why I'm next time. Now I don't get seasick on the ocean, but I get seasick on the nose. That's why I don't take mine to work in person. So, a real question. Here. What's that? Why are you in an army with personnel connections? So, with that, well, you know, times were tough in Miles City. Uh, <laughs> so, let's say you're leaving right here from Independence, Missouri. Independence, Missouri is just to the west or just to the east of present day Kansas City, Missouri. So, you take off right there. And how long would it take you to get to the Willamette Valley? Three months. Now, it's actually faster to go around South America or make the cutoff across Nicaragua, but that's significantly more expensive, like six or seven times more expensive. So, people had a little bit of money, so you could be poor to afford a wagon and the incredibly expensive supplies. You hope you left in April. Hopefully, the rains have died down because you have to ford every river. And if you're lucky, October? Dang. And if you're caught here and it's October, you're in real trouble. Or in the California cutoff, if you're caught here in the Sierra Nevadas, where it snows 100 inches. Yeah. That's what party was that? Donner. Donner. The Donner Party. Yeah, they got caught. And okay. some became lunch. They ran out of food. Some. Well, no, a bunch of them. It was awful. So to give you an idea how between in those 20 years, 250,000 people took those trails. Now you notice this is the total. Most at first went to Oregon, a couple blips in Utah, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But California be the two biggies because of the gold. Yeah, the gold rush. But look how many people went overland. That's a lot of people. 
Now, it would end 1860, combination of the war, but the train, railroad started moving, and then that's time. And you can always tell, too, uh, there was a panic and people were heading westward. Another gold rush. And this is where we get one of the great kind of this romantic vision. Remember that term romantic I talked about with the transcendentals? Kind of looking back to what you wanted the future to be. Oh, I'm sorry, that's he looking back to the future? Yes, that's a movie. 1985. Why do I know that? But, ooh, good point. Maybe I'm from 1985. I've never left it. And they look back to the past of what they wanted the future to be. The Hudson River School was the romantic art of the United States. You have these, all these pictures of what they're kind of the vision. And their romantic vision was the West. Like in Europe, it were like single mountains or those kind of things, pastoral scenes. Here we have, look at the Oregon River, or the Oregon Trail. And this dramatic shot into the sunset. It is a cool painting. I, the wagons going into the future or, or sorry, into a different world, I'm sorry. And the cliff, the majesty of this are people who never left New York are painting this. That is their vision of the West. And the reason I mention this is because beginning then, all the way through, for the rest of American history, the American West will have this kind of romantic image. After this, you have all these people going westward. After the Civil War, there's going to be these penny novels, little stories about gunfighters and all these stories of the West that are going to be incredibly important. There'll be a Wild West show, Buffalo Bills, a Wild West show that will go across the United States and into Europe. Be this vision of the West. When movies first came out, heck, until the 1960s, the most popular movies were Westerns. The first 20 years of TV, Westerns. And to this day, people talk about the West and have this kind of vision of it. You don't believe me, just whatever you catch on either TV or someone, like a commercial on TV, or when somebody mentions Montana in a movie, because you know they've never actually been there. Been here, but they have this kind of vision of what it is. And you still see that today. In fact, it's kind of funny when you see that. This kind of romantic image of the West. So it's stuck. So it turned out to be incredibly difficult. Awful vision. I mean, awful trip. It's dry. It's hard. But... This is the trail, and this is a very romanticized version of Bob's Oregon. Most of it's going to be dry as a bone. Pretty wet here, but a lot of rivers. And there'll be certain things like, June, you better be at Chimney Rock. You better be there or you're in trouble. Fourth of July, you better be at Independence Rock. And then when you get through Fort Hall, you, it better be um, before, you better be past here before the, end of, or before the middle of August. You know, certain spots, you had to be or you're in real trouble. And that's Chimney Rock, I wonder why they called it that. It actually used to be about 20 feet higher and broke off a couple different times. When I was a little kid, it was about 15 feet higher. I saw it and it broke off the next time I was there. Yeah, that, it's been like that for like 40 years. I know they've tried to do things to keep it up there, but it's gonna fall. It's really cool, it's big. It's kind of, wow, you can see why that'd be like a spot you'd know. It stocks off a little bit later on. And this actually wanted to show a river. You think about how, how do you get across a river? You get a ramp and you get the towers just really fast. You just have to have them swim and pull it across. You use, whack, um, use axle grease, whatever you can, to try to make your, your wagon waterproof and hope for the best. Think how scary every one you lose everything, including your life. Every single river. Those are like the moments. Okay, this is the moment that we passed. We got to pass here. These wagons were tiny. They couldn't hold much. And there is one family. That's, that is, um, as I understand, that's about 1848. That is 1855 or 1856. And those are actually going to Utah. Those are the second wave of Mormon, Mormon migrants. Because now it's part of the U.S. And, hmm? Yeah. I had a set up shop there. It was a way to make extra money. Don't move for six seconds. All right. So, if you ever get a chance to go to Independence Rock in Wyoming, it's really cool. It's this big rock. It kind of sits up. It's just noticeable because it's pretty flat. It's kind of rugged. And then this big rock. And on top and all over it, they carved in their names or with axle grease, wrote their names in as people as they went past. 
And if you see anything past 1860, just graffiti. And I don't like that. But before, it was like a marker, like, I did this. And I want people to know I was here and I made it this far. It's really cool when you think about it that way. And if you ever get a chance, go there. It's, it's a neat place. And I thought that just and not many, not far past the high plains, going into even that part of southern Idaho. Ooh. Uh, that's a tough area. And this is actually just west of Independence Rock, and that's what it still looks like today. You still see the wagon ruts from the Oregon Trail. It doesn't rain much, and they would make it on ridges. You make the trail on ridge tops as much as you can. I know it's a little bit harder to get up there and make the trail, but water doesn't wash it its way because water flows down there. You're in the bottom of a ridge, you got a river every time it rains. Cool place. And we must mention the Mormons very quickly because the Mormons are going to have a major impact on Western history, but also on the history of the West. It's actually kind of interesting, but it also fits in with the Second Great Awakening. And unlike a lot of those that started in that burnt over district, the Mormons started out as out of the mainstream, then becoming very mainstream, now one of the fastest growing churches in the world. Joseph Smith would start it. He actually was born in Vermont, but burnt over district. And so he started there with all this different. Uh, different churches and sects of Christianity, some going off to very radical forms. There are people speaking in tongues, we have any convulsions in this era of religious ecstasy, and so it kind of fit in that there'd be these different points of view. But for various reasons, and I'm not going to go into all the details, they, he and his followers, especially after he formed his church and wrote the Book of Mormon, that's actually one of the first copies of 18, from 1830, then to go to Ohio, the Missouri, he was actually tarred and feathered in Ohio. Then eventually, Nauvoo, Illinois, they'll run all the they'll run all Missouri, partially private, private militias, a number of things. Not going to go all the dip, the big risk reasons why. We got to remember this was a very anti-Catholic time. Well, think about Protestant during this Protestant revival in the United States, and you have a group that seems to be growing that has a different view of the importance or divinity of the Bible, and the big one was the nature of God. Or especially with Joseph Smith when he first thought God was actually more like a person and not a God. This messed with the Trinity. You know anything about the Christian church from like 300 to, well, let's say about ever, <laughs> to about 1500, the issue of the Trinity was, well, that's thousands would die over that issue. So to their point of view, they weren't uh, real Christians. There are a couple other things, but in Nauvoo, he actually, they were actually kind of thinking about going west, as we find out a little bit later. But in 1841, he announced plural marriage and that of all people there. Now, this is actually very controversial. If you know anything about what's going to happen to that church after 1850, part of reason coming to the United States. But according to a couple of different Mormon historians in 1884, 1885, they said he had 27 wives. I've seen as high as 35. I don't think it matters that much to this story here, except to the point of view that this was seen as very controversial. And another thing is, more and more, so the people could become almost divine. And that's the Latter day Saints. That's more complex than that, but if we only know little bits of it, that seems pretty scary. And then when he started developing his own private army and then said he's going to run for president, the non Christians were on Nauvoo and had enough, and they lynched Joseph Smith. This is actually him being tarred and feathered in Ohio, but he'd be lynched. And what is lynching? I always think of Hain too, but in reality, think about a mob and it's basically just torturing somebody to death. So Hain could be away, but just beating them and any, anything like that. He actually was beaten severely, shot, and thrown out of a window. That's a, and that's how he was killed. And the rest of the Mormon brothers, we got to get out of the U.S. And they'd been scouting this before, but now under the leadership of whom? Brigham Young. And I love, this is one of my favorite pictures. If you weren't sure, this is an old photo. Somebody wrote this on there. Old photo. If you weren't sure, looks new, but it could be old. And this is old style cut and paste where they cut out the picture of uh, um, Smith from one, pa one painting or one photograph, glued it on in front of Brigham Young, and then they kind of lighten the edges so you couldn't tell that's called hair brushing, and then take another picture and there. And then what they would do is they would try to put pink on their faces, and they would have to be used uh, and pink and maybe other things to try to lighten their complexion to make them look more human, and then they do a very good job. 
when I show you that video, well, I won't be here, but the video on Friday, you're going to see all these portraits, and they're going to have like these big pink splotches on them, where they actually use pink paint and try to paint like a complexion. It's really funny. You can understand why. Brigham Young, they actually scouted out before, but in 1846, a lot went to. Well, a place that they chose for a very important reason, right here, because it's in Mexico, and it's in a basin. A basin means that all the water flows into there. That's why it's salty. All the sediments, everything it takes from the, the mountains, wherever it goes over, it brings all those salts there and then deposits them. And over millions of years, that's where you get the salt flats, and it's incredibly salty. Great salt lake. I've never actually floated in it. I know people have happens, you can't sink. You just gotta bob on the salt. But I have it's so briny. Yeah, it's really briny. But who would want to live there? No. It could be safe. It could be safe. And it's a mess. And so Brigham Young went there. That's actually this is 1855. That was one of my pictures I took. But it's once they realized it could work, more Mormons from both Minnesota, I'm sorry, Missouri and Illinois came. That's 1847. I love this one from 1860. There's the Mormon Trail, which falls very close to the Oregon Trail. I love this one because you can see the laid out grid pattern. They're just starting to use those as cities. Brigham Young himself personally walked out the, the uh, blocks for the middle of Salt Lake City. You ever driven to Salt Lake City? It's one of the easiest big cities to get around. It's actually pretty remarkable to go to another one. Salt Lake City is like, why are you getting more facts? So that's Brigham Young's original design. They're following the grid cities that are starting to be used. But the thing is, it's really dry there. Combination of careful management, irrigation, they start to build it. Not that prosperous yet, but growing community. But we're not done yet. One of the things that's so interesting, why I just find it just fascinating, a pretty insular community here. What's insular? Something like an island. So it's relatively isolated because of where it is. That will change really fast down the road. But they also thought, we might have to run away again. Where do you go now? They started thinking Samoa or the Philippines. So Young sent people to a little tiny mission called Los Angeles as a kind of an outlet just in case. And they took many of the same practices from there. And as trying to dig wells, they found the San Fernando Aquifer. You went off of it, water, and they begin to irrigate grow crops there. Nobody lived there because it's a desert. But when they started making, you know, there might be water here. All these people follow, and that's how Los Angeles, as we know, and that's not It's kind of ironic, starting as a safety valve. It's basically the thought we might have to run away. Now we're going to come back to them because they think they're in Mexico and isolated. Things will change really fast in a few years. So. So, speaking of changing really fast, what changes it? Texas. Texas. Texas is going to become the symbol of all of this. If you look at this map in 1790, that is the percentage of slaves. There's still a few slaves up in the north. Look at red is bigger, how much bigger, more and more here. Now look at 1860. Look how dense the population of slaves are. You can see why these areas with such a dense population want to diffuse slavery, spread it out, but also to protect their, their investment. And that's why Texas will become such a big issue. Texas will be the intersection of manifest destiny and that desire to move westward with the sexual crisis over slavery. It will all come to Texas. Texas will represent that entire issue. Texas were represented all. And you could argue that the debates about annexing Texas will be the start of the Civil War because it puts it all together, Texas. So let's get to Texas. How did Texas become part of the U.S.? Well, actually, remember, it was a Spanish colony. And then in 1821, Texas won its independence. There is Father Hidalgo, one of the great heroes of Mexican independence. And I like the Mexican flag, so I put that up there. You know, it's kind of it's based on that flag. Yeah, the French flag. And the big problem was this. 
Mexico, this new country, huge. And before, there were separate little pieces of the Spanish Empire. Now it's this massive country. So you know how big Mexico is today? Double the size. All this area was Mexico, too. So that, that, those all became separate countries. So Mexico went down to the present border where it is southern border. It's Mexico. Even though, like in the Yucatan, there was a civil war, and they tried to become independent in a few other places like that. And you know, Mexico City is down here. What's here? I think desert. How do you administer this? The population was a real problem. They need more Mexican citizens up here to govern this area of control. They need more citizens. Has everyone got that? They were really worried that either American, uh, they call them freebooters or filibusters. I'll tell you more about that a little later. But Americans might come in and try to take this for slave states. Or what tribe was here? The most feared? Sheriff, you're back over here. Get to the sea. The Comanche. And the Comanche were the fiercest fighters of the plains. They took the horse like you cannot imagine taking to the horse. Hmm? How do I spell it? Comanche. Supposedly. Young Comanche men would be trained, you know, pretty much they were more, they, uh, the story was uh, when citizens of the U.S. had seen the fact that you guys were walking funny. They only looked graceful on horseback. They'd be on the horse all the time. And supposedly, a, a Comanche board, when they become ready to fight, they could fire between 12 and 15 arrows. Accurate. 200 yards while riding full, at full gallop in one minute. No, we're not done yet. How are they riding? They're hanging, holding on <laughs> under the neck of the horse and shooting using the neck as protection. That's without a saddle, without stirrups. So you know how the horse necks comes up like that? They would hang behind the neck and shoot under the neck. I can't even comprehend that. 200 yards. Yeah, accurately. <laughs> and remember now, yeah, they, you know, the United States has flintlock, flintlock muskets. They have better, more rifled barrels now. They're more accurate than what I brought in, a brown vest. Still, three shots a minute. And here's someone popping off 10, minutes, 10 arrows at you, like bang, 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 at the same distance. It's remarkable. And there weren't many Comanches, you can imagine, on the plane, so, you know, not a lot of water. But still, anybody want to move there? Volunteers? <laughs> Yes. And so they need people to hold this land. By the way, what would finally defeat the Comanches? United States. Uh, mm -hmm. You're on the right track. Colt revolvers. Yeah. Oh. Rapid fire. They couldn't. They couldn't deal with the rap modern weapons. They just didn't have enough. They were, and they are, and the discipline of the U.S. You know, they have the same kind of discipline. Mm -hmm. But they need people. So. Somebody came up with a great idea. Hey, let's ask citizens of the United States to move there. This is what we call a really bad idea for Mexico. Because everybody who comes from the United States, what do they bring with them? America. And that's what happened. They said, all you have to do is become a Mexican citizen and become Catholic, and you get free land. And what do you suppose happened in 1823 when they opened this up? Everyone walked in there. Free land. The first really big one. Big one. Big, uh, my you know, immigration, because we're crossing the border, Mexican citizen and Catholic. That is a cool thing. That's a Mexico City. I really like Mexico and the crime there is in some areas must be very sad. But Stephen Austin would come here and actually it's called Austin's Colony. He would lead a bunch of immigrants over. And basically, they have that deal. All they have to do is, you know, pledge your oath, say I'm a Catholic, boom. Now, what do you suppose citizens of the U.S. said? I'm Catholic. Yeah, I'm Catholic, whatever. They did the old, you see the fingers crossed? I'm Catholic. And do the pledge. 
And then as soon as they started making money and got all this free land, news went to other parts, mostly from the southern United States. And people came, just came, and just sat on land and took it. What do you call somebody who claims a land, who claims land, but they have no legal basis to do it? Squatters. squatters. <laughs> and it could be church. These are the one to go to the Mexicans. Squatters. And all these squatters came in, almost all from the United States, and what did they bring with them? America. America. Slaves. And their slaves. They forced their slaves. This is kind of a problem for Mexico, a country that's supposed to be based on the equality of all men. So, there's Austin. I wonder what he's. I wonder what he's. Um, gonna, what's going to be named after him? I don't know. Um, I don't know. It could be anything. Stephen something. Stevensville. Perhaps the capital of Texas. So, Santa Ana. I'm oh, sorry, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. Santa Ana would become. Actually, the Republic has a difficult time. It, would, it could not maintain control. And he, who was a very successful general putting down revolts, in 1832, he became dictator. And he actually didn't want to, felt obligated, and he had to get areas under control. You can imagine what happened. All these citizens from the U.S., even though it's called Tejas, they called themselves Texans, they didn't have control. And the Mexican citizens, called Tejanos, they didn't care what Mexico City said either. So Santa Ana had to regain control. They realized this was a terrible mistake. And by the way, a lot of them are going into California, too. A terrible mistake. And so they made, actually they passed, before he was dictator, these laws came into effect, but he enforced them, or at least tried to. No immigrants. That's done. No more squatters. It's done. And abolish them. So far, not to the Texans, who they believe they have every right to have slaves. Why do you want to take away my liberty to have slaves? And that infuriated them. Because then, if they're there, who's going to pick the cotton? To them, that was an act of war, and that would trigger the Texas independence. That would trigger war. And once we had the revolt, then he ended local government, and that was it. You get a match. Boom, it's done. And so, we have the war for Texas independence. Now, Texans don't like to talk about this, but the war was, the, the trigger was abolishing slavery. They want to turn into a fight for what? Freedom. There was an element of that. They did abolish the local government, but they abolished local government because of because um, the local government wasn't doing anything about slavery. But let me add this real quick. Last two things. The war for Texas independence would rage for two years. And the only reason I mentioned the Battle of Gonzales is because the Mexicans gave the Gonzales militia a cannon to defend themselves from Comanche. They, did, they refused to give up the cannon, and that became their flag. You've got to admit, that might be the coolest flag ever. All righty then. Now you can take your picture. What do you got? Ooh, you got to finish going to the moon today. Sorry, I'm tired. I'm just like places. Yeah, my dad was traveling. Yeah. 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 What? My dad yeah. Really, I'm not surprised because it's so warm. Yeah. So cool. yeah. They bought Beaver House. Yeah. It was a really good cool. yeah. They bought Kyle House. Yeah. 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 They're, um, they're yeah. extremely warm. Yeah. 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 It is very warm. Yeah. 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 Quite, quite warm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I knew I knew about the there were really good and I knew one or two they bought it. And my back they bought it on the front track. You know my ass. You know they went up there, they uh we had we had those bases up there. They're almost all gone now. Well, they are they were buying some of them for Get it done? That's pretty cool. Like muskrats are all on fever bumps for the key jackets and Kyle is in the line. That's my, my dad even almost all of his money for college that way. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, did you get my email by chance? No. Okay, well, you when did you send it? Ignore it but. You know, I, somebody who remained nameless didn't look at the email. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if I could come in after school for the test, but would it actually be possible if I could take this tomorrow? Just remind me. Okay. Because I have to, have to be about to go and I have to give a subscription. So I have to be so Right, 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 right before the end of the summer. Okay, so um, I'm going to be gone tomorrow during class, but I know it's the last time, or last Thursday I'll be gone for this next day, but um, I can like come back, because I don't have a second day, but I'll come back, back during class. Thank you, is that okay? Yeah, right. Thank you. She's got a weird ear. Sorry. Okay, yeah. That face, I was like, uh. I don't like to brag, but I could go get professional training in larger, small scale assessment with the Apperton scanner and data link. Ooh. Yeah, I know. I know. Wow. Did I just blow you guys away? Huh? Well, and I'm, I just enjoy making you guys feel. Hey, it's Max out there? Oh, Max, did I tell you I sent him the, like, um, seeing in the Blue Brothers where they're like, I hate to look at Nazi. It's Max, where's Max? We're going to Mexico next week. I got to get on the Mexico gravy train. I like Mexico. Mexicans are very nice. All right, so. Why is the ball pink? Because it's pink. It's called a classic. Yeah, okay. 
All right, so first thing is first. I thought we did not know all. <laughs> you would have you would have like a cat. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to finish up the moon and then tomorrow. Oh, I'm not gonna be on a Friday. Oh, how dare you? So I might, we might be going to the library. We might not. Do you like when I say it like that? It's like Illinois. Is that really a noise? How about Indiana? Yes. 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 Tomorrow, uh, finish up any loose ends, and then there's one more thing I thought about. Nobody did. There are a couple of conspiracies. Nobody did, so I thought I'd do a few of those. But the moon one is just so fascinating to me. And I'm really fascinated by the ability of people to believe stuff. That's what gets me more than anything. I just. So, a couple more things, and then we are going to watch a television show. Yeah. It, it sounds like they bit off more than they did. <laughs> That's actually, yeah, because it's a perfect metaphor. Maybe the movie will be a perfect metaphor. Did I show off the screen or did it just go away? They don't want us to know. That's weird. You didn't even touch it. Okay, so what about the lunar rover? That thing is huge. And by the way, when I first saw one of these go, oh, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. I did too. Oh. And that was pretty awesome. How do we, and not only, not only how does it uh, move at all with the weight, but, and we'll get to the city tracks, but also, the limb is made out of what? How'd they get that there? The aliens left it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just had a rope and they <laughs> drug it on. How'd you know? <laughs> Actually, have you ever seen a, a parachute a parachuter in the army? They don't want to carry their pack on their back. Because it's, you don't want another 100 pounds on your back when you land, smash. So they have a rope and they hang it down from their, they have a patch to their waist. And their pack hangs below. So how did you know? Were you? The aliens bring you? Yep. Now actually, I show you a couple of examples of how things can happen and they're not true. They designed to fit on the limb. It's made with lightweight material. So yeah, that's not. And that's the guy who was under the lamb in that picture. Oh, oh, oh. He was stuck. <laughs> Where are the tracks? Oh, that's Wait, if, it, if it's on the moon, couldn't they just pick it up and carry it over that it's so light? Just about. And that was part of it, too. And there are tracks. There are tracks all over the place. <laughs> so once again, some of these are absolutely ridiculous. And... There is them practicing on the Earth, and it's a little bit different vehicle. I think that's kind of funny with radial tires. And another one that's really controversial is how did they get high def video on the cameras on the moon? How'd they do that? How did they get through the radiation belt? Stuck it up <laughs> now, if you want to watch, you can watch a 45 minute show on Band in America on this. But needless to say, it's this it's crazy. There are some things that are kind of like, okay, wait a second. How do you, the track, yeah, the footprint, that's interesting. No, no crater when the lamb lands. Okay, I can see that. Well, you know, that's interesting. This, no, they just have regular cameras and it's not high depth. 
<laughs> but if you say, how they get high devil? Yeah, how did they? By not bringing it. We're not going to watch it. Here's another really big one. Just outside the Earth's atmosphere, it's called the Van Allen belt. Van Allen belt. And it's radiation. What happens is the magnetism of the Earth will collect radiation in the space and kind of gather around, but not pass through to get to the atmosphere. And so the whole idea is this is from one of the conspiracy theorists. Not only what might have killed them, but how do you get transmission across? How do you deal with the time delay? This would not have worked. If they would have died. Good question, right? Sounds pretty scary. And it looks something like this. I just thought this was funny. Time, flux, and shield. Okay. But. So they couldn't have got these pictures from the, from the way over. They would have been either affected by the radiation. They would have been very ill. Now, do you want to know how? Alien technology. And there was a whole conspiracy that that's how they did it. So not only do they not know about the Van Allen belt, but then they assumed that they needed only alien technology. And somebody said, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Aliens did it. How much radiation do you suppose is out there in Van Allen? Well, a lot, right? Okay. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> About 50. <laughs> About as much radiation going through that as getting an x ray. Now, don't get me wrong, you don't be sitting on the x-ray table. And in fact, they used to have these things at shoe stores. It was a big deal where you could get, you could go stick your foot in and there's an x-ray machine. And then you could figure out your exact size of your feet. Your shoe fits. You stick your feet into an unshielded x-ray machine. Well, you're talking about the cost of not using the x-ray. You're not talking about the cost of the x-ray. I mean, that's just the machine. You're talking about the training technician and the person reading it. All that adds is the cost. And since they have a monopoly, they add more. But the x-ray machine itself is not expensive, especially if you, don't have to have, if you don't have to have any safety features on it. But if it hospitals are monopolies, they can charge you. So, <laughs> and if someone says you need an x-ray, you're not going to say no. Eh, it's not broken. I'll be fine. I'm not going to pay that $500. So, we're going to get to the reflectors. By the way, these are the reflectors. We'll get to these in a sec in the video we're going to see. But there are videos. There are movies. There are all these things that Stanley Kubrick actually directed the whole thing. And he was approached to direct this, and he would actually take elements of his classic movie, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and he was practicing the techniques that he would use on faking the moon landing in the movie. That's part of how they funded this movie. Came from money from NASA to save their prestige. Has anyone seen 2001 The Space Odyssey? It's, it's pretty boring. I, I like Kubrick a lot. I don't like this movie. You have to be dedicated to watch the crew stay awake. But, but Delaney is right. The cinematography is amazing. That's right. <laughs> Don't get too full of yourself. <laughs> so, you want to see the trailer? No. It's actually, it's not, it's just not. Oh, where's my mouse? You watch it pretty easily. Where did that come from? <laughs> that was weird. The U.S. citizen. 